Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today I wish to revisit the gravitational collapse of a gaseous cloud to form a star. Those of you who are familiar with this channel recognize that I have already touched on the subject several times, but the issue is so important relative to the collapse of the standard model that we need to touch upon it once again. First, I presented these two videos on intensive and extensive properties, emphasizing that the temperature must always be intensive. Otherwise, one violates the zeroth law. I then applied the concept in these four videos, highlighting that many equations in astrophysics have temperatures which are non-intensive. Therefore, the equations are scientifically invalid as they cannot be reconciled with thermodynamics. This not only includes the equation advanced by Jeans, Eddington, and Chandrasekhar relative to the treatment of a gaseous star, but also the equation for the temperature of a black hole and the unruh temperature. In thermodynamics, entropy must always be extensive, but the Hawking entropy equation for a black hole is not extensive, as we saw here. In addition, when the astronomers invoke gravitational collapse to form a star, they end up with a decreasing entropy. However, in an isolated system, entropy can never decrease for a spontaneous process. It must always increase. The astronomers also try to argue that the collapsing stellar mass is also emitting black body radiation, and that is how the entropy change manages to be positive. Yet that was never a condition in the original derivation. In any event, they have no mechanism to produce black body radiation. They just pull it out of a hat because they never question the validity of Kirchhoff's law of thermal emission. They treat black body radiation as their get out of jail free card. They invoke it whenever needed by uttering the words thermal equilibrium, as if that was the only requirement to produce a photon. It is now clear that the production of black body spectra requires the presence of a true vibrational lattice as I explained in these papers and as we saw in these videos. A collapsing gaseous cloud has no lattice. As a result, the violation of the second law remains. In this video, I have also explained that a system cannot do work upon itself and increase its own temperature. That is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. The surroundings must do work on the system. Next, astronomers cannot assume that the kinetic energy of a collapsing gaseous cloud is equal to 3 halves n in RT. That finding came from the kinetic theory, where all of the energy within the system remained contained within the kinetic energy of motion. One cannot now impose gravitational potential energy on such a system and still keep the conclusions from kinetic theory as we saw in this video. Finally, astronomers use the Virio theorem to treat the collapsing gas cloud, but this is also forbidden. The Virio theorem can only be applied to a bound system. The Virio theorem implies that the kinetic energy of the system must be equal to minus one half of the gravitational potential energy. This is true for a satellite around a planet, for instance. That is a bound system. However, it is never true for gaseous mass because the individual particles in such a mass are never bound. If one applies the Virio theorem to a gaseous mass, one obtains a non-intensive temperature, which is a violation of the zeroth law. Again, as we saw in this video. Now I wish to turn my attention to the Jeans mass and what became known as a Jeans swindle. If one searches the astrophysical literature, Various expressions can be found for the gene's mass, and here are examples with associated references linked below. Kip and Hom and Weiger tell us that depending on the perturbation problem and its geometry, one finds slightly different prefactors in the expression for the gene's mass, but they all give the same order of magnitude. The gene's mass represents the mass of a gaseous cloud which is stable relative to collapse because the forces of gravity within the cloud are perfectly balanced against the external gas pressure. If a gaseous cloud has a mass greater than the gene's mass, it will collapse due to the forces of gravity. Now if one considers the expected densities of a gaseous cloud, 
in the 10 to the minus 24 grams per centimeter cube range, along with a temperature of roughly 100 Kelvin, then the gene's mass works out to be about 10 to the fifth times the mass of the sun, as one can learn in this classic text. So gaseous clouds of reasonable size to form a star actually do not collapse, given the expression advanced by genes. The astronomers must invent some means of breaking up or fractioning the collapsing mass to get a star of reasonable size. Genes characterize the mass he wished to collapse as confined to a spherical gaseous region of radius r. The initial logic to his derivation can be found in this paper, where genes considers sound speed within the cloud. It is also possible to obtain the genes mass by applying the virial theorem. Both approaches lead to a mass which is non-extensive and thereby imply that all expressions for the genes mass violate fundamental thermodynamics. Now, if you study Jeans' famous 1902 paper, you will be a little surprised by what you find. The problem comes in defining the radius of a collapsing gaseous cloud. Of course, a gaseous cloud cannot have any properly defined radius because gaseous clouds do not have a unique surface. Jeans recognized this and wrote, The principal difficulty lies in finding a system which shall satisfy the ordinary gas equations and shall at the same time give an adequate representation of the primitive nebula of astronomy. Of course, the ordinary gas equation, PV equals nRT, was defined using containers with real surfaces. That is how one can speak of pressure in that gas. In kinetic theory, pressure is generated at the walls of the container. Jeans continues, if we begin by supposing a nebula to consist of a gas which satisfies at every point the ordinary assumed gas equations, and to be free from the influence of all external forces, then the only configuration of equilibrium is one which extends to an infinite distance, and is such that the nebula contains an infinite amount of gas. With that simple sentence, Jeans has just explained why the problem of the gaseous nebula collapsing on itself cannot be solved. Jeans recognizes the need of an infinite system for which there is no solution. He tries to resolve the problem, but at the same time recognizes that the density in the outermost part of the nebula would not be great enough to allow the application of statistical methods, and that the gaseous equations would thus break down. He eventually circumvents the problem with these words. The difficulty could be avoided by supposing that the nebula is of finite size, and that the equilibrium is maintained by a constant pressure applied to the outer surface of the nebula. If this pressure is so great that the density of the gas at the outer surface is sufficiently large to justify us in supposing that the gas equations are satisfied everywhere inside the surface, then the difficulty in question will have been removed. The outer pressure genes required would come from molecules or meteorites. Here is an example of how far he reaches. Suppose next that the matter outside S, which is the surface, consists mainly of molecules or of masses of matter which are describing hyperbolic or parabolic orbits, or which come from infinity and after rebounding from the nebula return to infinity. That sentence is completely unreasonable. Jeans is imagining that a particle is coming from infinity, strikes the nebula, and then returns to infinity in order to create the forces he requires to contain the gaseous mass to a fixed radius. But his nebula surface is just imaginary. His particle can strike any region outside or within the nebular surface before it returns to infinity. There is no surface. This highlights the central problem for the collapse of a gaseous mass. The surface or radius of the mass cannot be defined. So all equations applied to gases that involve a radius or surface area are outside the bounds of physics. Jeans considers the nebula acted upon by an external system, and that is how he fixes the radius r. The entire paper is not much different than a work of fiction. The addition of external forces from molecules outside the collapsing nebular surface eventually became known by some in astrophysics as the Jeans swindle. Of course, if you talk to the astronomers, many will discount the Jeans swindle. They claim that everything has been corrected and that genes did not swindle everyone with his derivation. I disagree. The analysis which genes applied in treating the collapse of a gaseous cloud is an appeal to the irrational. It should have had no place in science. But here we sit today with every young astrophysicist confident that genes did nothing wrong because after all, they were taught that the genes mass was legitimate. 
Jeans also had served as secretary of the Royal Society, so how could it be that he could have ever lacked such scientific insight? These questions are difficult to answer, especially since James Jeans was the last major proponent of liquid stars, as I described in this paper. Still, he made a significant misstep relative to deriving the Jeans mass, and it is worthwhile to understand the error. Here is a quote. It was later pointed out by other astrophysicists that, in fact, the original analysis used by Jeans was flawed for the following reason. In his formal analysis, Jeans assumed that the collapsing region of the cloud was surrounded by an infinite static medium. In fact, because all scales greater than the Jeans length are also unstable to collapse, any initial static medium surrounding a collapsing region will in fact also be collapsing. As a result, the growth rate of the gravitational instability relative to the density of the collapsing background is slower than predicted by Jeans' original analysis. This flaw has come to be known as the Jeans swindle. Yet astronomers now claim that later analysis have corrected for this effect. A mathematical vindication of the gene swindle has been proposed by Kiesling, as one can learn in this paper. Some in astrophysics feel offended with the use of the word swindle, as one can learn in this book. Nonetheless, a swindle is exactly what it was. Here is a quote from that text. Recently, in 1999, Kiesling considered the problem of the gene swindle as the limit of a well-behaved mathematical problem and demonstrated that Jeans's result was perfectly valid in the limit of an infinite medium, whence there was no physical justification for the word swindle. The problem, of course, is that there can be no infinite medium around a collapsing cloud. Astrophysicists have even tried to claim that the problem of the Jeans swindle can now be solved by the expansion of the universe. Here is a quote. When measuring the mass profile of any given cosmological structure through internal kinematics, the distant background density is always ignored. This trick is often referred to as the gene swindle. Without this trick, a divergent term from the background density renders the mass profile undefined. However, this trick has no formal justification. We show that when one includes the expansion of the universe in the genes equation, a term appears which exactly cancels the divergent term from the background. We thereby establish a formal justification for using the genes swindle. So now, more than a hundred years after genes' swindle, astrophysicists claim that they have solved the problem by invoking the expansion of the universe. Such claims demonstrate how far they are willing to go to defend the indefensible. The problem is that they need the gene's mass, and they will defend it at any cost. Mathematics aside, the reality is that genes recognize that it is not possible to define an area of a gaseous cloud unless some external force is permitted to restrict the spatial extent of the cloud. That was the purpose of a static medium, yet his derivation was invalid. The gene's mass is not extensive. The radius of a gaseous nebular mass cannot be defined without an external force acting upon the nebula, and the fragmentation required of the gene's mass to form a star of reasonable size is just conjecture. Furthermore, gaseous stars possess negative heat capacity, contrary to the known behavior of gases. Again, I pose the question to the astronomers. How massive does a gas have to become before its heat capacity changes from positive to negative? This question exposes the untenable nature of their claims. One cannot form gaseous stars from gravitational collapse, as a review of the gene's mass derivation now fully demonstrates. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, Support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.